On the 26th of March, 1856, the unknown daughter of Emma, Lady Hamilton, died in Florence, Italy. The firstborn daughter of one of the most celebrated and infamous women of the late 18th and early 19th century, Emma Caru passed away in relative poverty, her burial paid for by a Mr. Smith of a charitable foundation. Up until 2013, the last 46 years of Miss Caru's life had remained a mystery to both biographers of Emma Hamilton and historians alike. However, researchers Anna Knowles, Professor Julia Bolton Holloway and Jackie Livesey uncovered the last movements of Emma Caru via the records of the English Cemetery in Florence and the story of Lady Hamilton's secret daughter was finally laid to rest. Emma Caru was born Emma Hart in the early months of 1782. No records of her birth have ever been found, although it is believed that her mother, Lady Emma Hamilton, who was then herself known as Emma Hart, gave birth to the child at the house of her grandmother, Mrs Kidd, at the age of 17. The child's father was never confirmed, although the Emma Hamilton biographies written throughout the years agree that it was one of three men. Captain John Willett Payne, Sir Harry Featherstone Hoare, or Sir Charles Greville. Although it is possible that Emma and Willett Payne could have had more than just a dalliance, if indeed they ever met, as there is no written proof of this, it is highly unlikely that he was the father of her firstborn, and the evidence strongly points towards Featherstone Hoare. In 1777, at the age of just 12, Emma Hamilton, who was then known as Emmy or Amy Lyon, moved from the small Cheshire village of her birth to London and gained employment as a maid and then later, it was rumoured, at the Temple of Health, dressed as a goddess. Between the years of 1777 and 1779, she allegedly met with Willett Payne and certainly met with Featherstone Hoare. The latter, being captivated by the young Emma, whisked her away to his country house of Upak on the South Downs to work in his employment as a hostess. There, she met with Sir Charles Greville, the second son of the Earl of Warwick, and developed a bond with him. She would later call upon this bond to help her out of the homelessness she faced after finding out that she was with child. In December 1781, the then heavily pregnant Emma penned the following letter to Greville. I am almost distracted. I can't come to town for want of money. I have not a farthing to bless myself with and I think my friends look coolly on me, I think. Oh God, that I was in your possession. What a happy girl I would be. I am almost mad. Oh, for God's sake, tell me what is to become of me. Write to me. In January 1782, Greville wrote the following reply. Sir Harry may be informed of the circumstance which may reasonably make him doubt, and it is not worthwhile to make it a subject of altercation. Its mother will obtain its kindness from me and shall never want. What is clear is that the young Emma Hamilton saw men as a means to avail herself from both her current situation and the poverty that she had been born into. Throughout her life, she was a woman who drew on the resources available to her in order to not only benefit herself, but those around her. Regardless of this desperate plea at the age of 17, Emma remained calm in the face of adversity and did not flee immediately back to her hometown to accept her life of poverty like her mother before her, 
that made sure that both she and her unborn child were taken care of via a man of title in London. Mrs Emma Hart, a name that she had been persuaded to take by Greville, named her first-born daughter Emma. The child, little Emma, as she was soon known, was born sometime before March the 12th, 1782, when her mother sat for the painter George Romney. Swiftly deposited at Harden, on the Welsh border, with her great-grandmother Mrs Kidd, her mother returned to London to begin her career in earnest as an artist's muse whilst living with Greville at his house in Paddington. Until 1784, the child remained in situ at Harden and was provided for by funds regularly sent by Greville. The parentage of little Emma is almost confirmed in a letter from her mother, where she writes of Greville, Does he not provide for me? Is he not a father to my child? A father, as opposed to the father, seems a clear indication that Emma knew that Greville was not her daughter's father. However, in her biography of Emma, Nora Lofts presents the theory that if Sir Harry Featherstone Hoare had fathered little Emma, he would have married her mother, as later he married his dairymaid and provided for her and her family. Lofts goes on to explain that Emma must have offended Sir Harry deeply and given him good reason to suggest that he was not the father of her child, due to his casting her out of Arpark so suddenly. Indeed, it appears that an altercation had taken place between Featherstone Hoare and the hot-headed Emma, but the nature of the argument was never disclosed. In June 1794, Emma travelled to Harden to collect her two-year-old daughter from her grandmother and be reunited with her for the first time since her birth. She paid Mrs Kidd five guineas, which was the extra that the old lady had spent on the little girl after the regular payments from Greville. Along with her mother, who had changed her name from Mrs Lyon to Mrs Cadogan, Emma made the journey with her daughter to the popular bathing resort of Parkgate in Cheshire, with its pretty seaside houses of red and white, long promenade and fashionable entertainments. The reason behind her mother's name change is possibly due to the fact that the older woman feared being recognised with an unmarried daughter and her small child in tow. On the 3rd of July... 1784, Emma wrote to Greville from Parkgate. What a pleasure I have to think that poor little Emma will be comfortable and happy. If she does turn out well, what a happiness it shall be, and I hope she will for your sake. I will teach her to pray for you as long as she lives, and if she is not grateful and good, it won't be my fault. I come into your way of thinking... Holidays spoil children. It takes their attention from their school. It gives them a bad habit. Now Emma will never expect what she never had. So I hope she will be very good, mild and attentive, and we may have a deal of comfort. Oh, Greville, if her poor mother had ever had the luck and prospered, merely in having a good education that she has... What a woman she might have been. But I dare think. P.S. I bathe Emma, and she is very well grown, and her hair will grow very well on her forehead, and I don't think her nose will be snub. Her eyes are blue and pretty. She speaks countrified, but will forget it. We squabble sometimes. Still, she is fond of me, and indeed I love her. For she is sensible. So much for beauty. Emma and Mrs Cadogan had found a reasonable apartment at the Landmore's lodgings on Station Road, right by the sea. Next door lived a family friend, Albin Roberts Burt, who was a miniature artist and engraver. In a cruel yet uncanny twist of fate, 
in 1822. His cottage was renamed Nelson's Cottage, and the name Nelson, set in stones in the front garden, which can still be seen to this day. But Sun, who was named Nelson after the great admiral, was tragically drowned, age nine, when the passenger steamboat Prince Regent was caught in a storm, travelling from Liverpool. Emma's final letter to Greville, from Parkgate, in August 1794, painted a slightly different picture to the portrayal of her little daughter in her letter sent the month before. She wrote, She is as wild and thoughtless as somebody when she was a little girl. What shall we do with her, Greville? Such words were obviously put into Emma's head by her own mother, no doubt recounting her own daughter's youth. Emma continued that she and her young daughter had a little quarrel and I did slap her on the hands and when she came to kiss me and make it up, I took her on my knee and cried. Now do you blame me or not? Pray tell me, O oh Greville, you don't know how much I love her. Indeed I do when she comes and looks in my face and calls me mother. For all the mother's feelings rise at once and tells me I ought to be a mother. It is this outpouring of love for little Emma which makes what happened next even more poignant. When Emma returned to London for the seaside later on that month, she took her daughter with her to briefly reside alongside her at Greville's house. The artist George Romney expressed interest in painting an oil sketch of the child, but the picture was abandoned when little Emma caught measles. The sadness behind this is that it would have been the one image of Emma to be preserved, as to this day no others have been found. Greville returned home to London from his trip to Wales to find the child at his home, and began to arrange plans for the so-called wild little girl to be housed somewhere more suitable. Sometime before early December, little Emma was dispatched to Manchester to live in the care of Mr and Mrs Blackburn and their daughters on Market Lane, a couple that Greville stated he had full confidence in. He had already written in a letter to Emma when she was at Parkgate, that he would provide for her daughter and give her a good education, but that he was not willing to have her as part of his household. Emma replied, somewhat stoically, All my happiness is now in Greville, to think that he loves me. The little girl, who spent holidays at her great-grandmother's house in Harden, was not heard of again, until 1791, when she was visited in Manchester by her grandmother, Mrs Cadogan. By that time, her mother had been introduced to Sir William Hamilton, the British ambassador to the court of Naples, by his nephew, none other than Sir Charles Greville, and had taken up residence in Italy and was subsequently marrying Sir William. The pairing swiftly made Emma an international celebrity of the day, a pairing which little Emma might well have heard about in the British press. Having been brought up by the Blackburns, little Emma had not had any contact with her mother since leaving London at the age of two. On hearing that this illustrious woman was home from Naples, and knowing that there was some kind of connection between them, the now nine-year-old little Emma had set about ornamenting a box with filigree as a gift for her. The possibility of the new Lady Hamilton being her mother had never been discussed, and the little girl had long forgotten the time in Parkgate and the woman that she had formerly called mother, although she must have asked questions both to her great-grandmother and to the Blackburns. Charles Greville had more than just a little hand in manipulating the marriage of his uncle, Sir William, and Emma. Having turned her from Amy Lyon to Mrs Emma Hart, given her a home and education, he decided 
that it was time for her to move on. Greville, at this point, can either be viewed as a possible Henry Higgins of his time, having spent tireless hours and quite a bit of money in educating and shaping Emma into a woman who could converse on all levels of society with ease and grace. Greville could also be seen as a man who had tired of the acquaintance of his mistress and wished to focus the rest of his days on his other loves of science and horticulture. Thirdly, he could be seen as an insightful nephew who realised that the introduction of Sir William and Emma would help the older man to overcome the death of his dear wife and give him a companion whom he could take to Naples and be proud to show it court. Whichever of these is true, Greville succeeded in manipulating Emma to finally make the journey to Italy with her mother in tow and begin a new life there with Sir William. Of course, it could have been as simple as a financial transaction. On Emma's marriage to Sir William Hamilton, Greville had presented his uncle with a bill for £32.11 and shillings for the upkeep and ongoing education of little Emma Hart. He wrote to Sir William Hamilton, stating that he had taken the liberty. I communicate it to you instead of Lady Hamilton, because I know it would give her some embarrassment, and she might imagine it unkind of me so soon to trouble you about her protégé. He concluded that... The natural attachment to a deserted orphan may be supposed to increase from the length of time she has been protected. I have avoided any such sentiments by having only found the means to indulge so amiably a sentiment on Lady Hamilton. On seeing her granddaughter in Manchester, Mrs. Cadogan wrote to Greville, confirming that she was situated to her satisfaction. The only other reference to the visit was the accounts of little Emma herself, which read, Filigree box for Mrs. Hart, by order of Mrs. Cadogan, two pounds, twelve shillings. Three years passed before Emma Hart was heard of again, living, as Greville had instructed her guardians, nothing beyond the quiet and retired life. His insistence of this draws certain conclusions that he did not want the wild tendencies that little Emma had exhibited when she was a tiny girl to turn into the tenacious drive that her mother had shown at a young age when she moved to London to find her destiny. Any such spirit should, in Greville's mind, be crushed. He could surely not afford another free spirit on his hands. However, her mother had other ideas. In a letter from Caserta, Italy, dated 1794, three years after her marriage to Sir William, Emma Hamilton wrote to Greville, Do send me a plan how I could situate little Emma. Poor thing, I wish for it. Thus, ten years after their seaside holiday to Parkgate, Emma's thoughts turned to rekindling the lost relationship between her and her daughter. On this instruction, Greville wrote to Sir William, asking if he should bring her to live in the British Embassy in Naples with her mother and stepfather, in the guise of Mrs Cadogan's niece, or to give her a dowry and marry her to a good sort of man. On Sir William's refusal, and in January 1795, Greville wrote to Lady Hamilton, confirming that he had inquired about her young protégé via the Blackburn family, and that she will not be tall or handsome, but of a good disposition, and nothing more was mentioned of the child. In 1800, Sir William and Lady Hamilton returned to England, accompanied by Nelson, and bought a country house in Merton, which Nelson fondly called the farm. Nelson departed in early 1801, and in January of that year, Emma gave birth to his daughter, who Nelson wanted to name after its mother. Emma, however, 
chose the name Horatia, the feminine version of the child's father's Christian name, and placed her almost immediately with a wet nurse who was told that the baby had been born six weeks earlier to a Captain Thompson, thus avoiding any inference that she might be the mother. At around the same time, Emma's mother, Mrs Cadogan, was dispatched to Manchester to visit her granddaughter, who was now 19. From the correspondence, it appears that little Emma, having left the pupillage of the Blackburns, was to be relocated in Padstow, Cornwall, as a governess. The same year, Nelson began to refer to little Emma as your relative, in correspondence to Lady Hamilton. Although most biographers have argued that he did not know the true identity of Emma Hart, the nature of the letters in comparison to the way Nelson guardedly writes about his own daughter Horatia suggest otherwise. For example, in September 1801, he wrote, If your relation cannot stay in your house in town, surely Sir William can have no objections to your taking her to the farm. The pride of the Hamilton surely cannot be hurt by sitting down with any of your relations. You have surely as much right to your relations to come into the house as his could have. It is vexed, as I know it must have given you great pains. Maybe use me for your happiness. Within a week, Nelson followed this letter with another, stating, Tell me how I can do anything for you at this distance. I hope, Emma, you take care of your relative. When you can get her well married and settled, we will try and give her something. From a letter from Captain John Tyson's wife to Emma Hamilton, on the 28th of December, 1802, it appears that by this time, the now-named Emma Hartley had indeed visited Merton or the farm. The correspondence requested consent for Miss Hartley to go with us to a grand ball given by the rector of the parish of Woolwich. For had Miss H been at home, it is our intention to request your ladyship to let her return with us. It appears that Lady Hamilton had, at some point, welcomed Emma Hartley to Merton, potentially as one of the Connor family, her relatives who sometimes looked after Horatia. On the 18th of May, 1803, Emma Hartley is recorded at 23 Piccadilly, Sir William's London home, as one of two witnesses at the marriage of Nelson's niece, Kate Bolton. Six weeks before this occasion, Sir William Hamilton had died, aged 72, and Nelson had departed back to sea. This event serves as yet another indication that Nelson knew more about Miss Hartley than it appears from his letters to Lady Hamilton. The year before, he had written to his former secretary and friend, John Tyson, whose wife had invited little Emma to Woolwich, stating... Go to Mr Noble and receive from him Miss Hartley's passage money as she cannot go to Naples till Mrs Braddock's arrives and also get from him a letter. To send up Miss Hartley's clothes. Send the letter to Padstow this day that no time may be lost. Although the identity of Mr Noble and Mrs Braddock's has long faded into history, it seems from this letter that Nelson was still pursuing the dream that Lady Hamilton had of sending little Emma to Naples, even though, by this time, her mother was firmly situated back in England. Such a passage was never made by Emma Hartley, at least not until six years later, and under her own steam. Shortly after the wedding of Kate Bolton, Emma Hamilton's third child, a daughter whom she also named little Emma, was born. The baby survived only two months and died of influenza, which had badly debilitated both her mother 
and Sister Horatia. Nelson penned a letter to Emma Hamilton in August 1805 on his return to England, where he stated, I would not have my Emma's relative go without seeing her, which again strongly suggests that Emma Hartley was at Merton at this time in the company of her mother. On the 21st of October, 1805, Lord Horatio Nelson was killed aboard his ship, the Victory, at the Battle of Trafalgar. Reports suggest that Miss Emma Hartley's name was again changed, this time to Emma Carew. The next mention of her is in a significant letter from Lady Hamilton to Sir Harry Featherstone Hoare in July 1806, which serves as evidence that he was, indeed, the child's father, as in the postscript Lady Hamilton wrote, Burn this. If you do me this favour, let me know by a wire. E goes tonight, but she is taken care of in case of an accident. I wish to do all that could be comfortable for our friend, who, be assured, in case of an accident is provided for, and she has gone into the country again. Happy ever. In fact, there was no provision for Emma Carew, in Lady Hamilton's will. Later that year, there was a curious occurrence. A so-called imposter arrived at Merton, purporting to be Anne Carew, daughter of Lady Emma Hamilton. Nelson's relatives, Mrs Bolton and Mrs Matcham, were made aware of the incident in a letter of apology and explanation by Lady Hamilton which told that the stranger was none other than a mentally unwell relative of hers from the Connor side of the family. Biographers of Emma Hamilton are split into two camps as to whether this mystery woman was really who she claimed, some believing the story of Mad Anne Connor and concluding that it was a ruse to trick Lady Hamilton into including her in her will, possibly via blackmail. Others, however ascertained that it really was the 24-year-old daughter of Emma and that she may have been driven by a desire to be finally recognised by her mother. Subsequently, Lady Hamilton responded strongly to the allegation, writing that Anne Connor, who goes by the name of Karu and tells many falsehoods, was not her daughter. At this point in her life, Emma Hamilton was a woman whose splendid career was now quickly fading, who the government, press and public had turned against, and who was reliant on the kindness of those around her. To confess that she had given birth to an illegitimate child at the age of 17 was to risk the scorn and judgment of those she relied upon to keep her head above water. By turning Emma Caru away, She protected herself and Horatia from an onslaught of negativity and, worse still, ostracisation. Emma Caru continued her employment as a governess, an occupation that she did not enjoy. She had inherited her mother's weak chest and at times was badly incapacitated by this. A gap of three years went by, before Emma Carew was heard of again, this time in a letter to Emma Hamilton, sent by her old Cheshire friend, Eliza Grafer. Eliza mentioned poor little Emma, who she stated was in a very bad way. She concluded, I think before this reaches you, she will be in paradise. She is the very image of her mother. No response to this letter exists, so we can only imagine the impact that this revelation had on Emma Hamilton. A year later, in November 1810, Emma Hamilton received a letter from Emma Carew, 
It is worth reciting in full, as the implications that it makes and conclusion that could be drawn from it relate not only to the fact that Emma Carew knew very well who her mother was, but also that she had more than likely attempted to visit her at Merton in 1806 and had been turned into a seemingly unstable imposter by Lady Hamilton herself. The letter reads... Mrs. Dennis's mention of your name and the conversation she had with you have renewed ideas in my mind which an absence of four years has not been able to efface. It might have been happy for me to have forgotten the past and to have begun a new life with new ideas, but for my misfortune my memory traces back circumstances which have taught me too much yet not quite all I could have wished to have known. With you that resides, and ample reason, no doubt, you have for not imparting them to me. Had you felt yourself at liberty, so to have done, I might have become reconciled to my former situation, and have been relieved from my painful employment that I now pursue. It was necessary, as then I stood, for I had nothing to support me, but the affection I bore you, on the other hand, doubts and fears by times oppressed me, and I was determined to rely on my own efforts rather than submit to abject dependence without a permanent name of acknowledged parents. That I should have taken such a step shows at least that I have a mind misfortune has not subdued, that I should persevere in it is what I owe to myself and to you for it shall never be said that I avail myself of your partiality on my own inclination, unless I learn my claim on you is greater than you have hitherto acknowledged. But the time may come when I show you both my duty and my attachment. In the meantime, Mrs. Dennis's zeal and kindness have not overrated your expressions repeating me, and that you should really wish to see me, I may be believed in saying that such a meeting would be one of the most happiest moments of my life, but for the reflection that it may also be the last, as I leave England in a few days, and may, perhaps, never return to it again. Emma Caru was correct in assuming that she would never again return to England. Her departure to Italy in the last month of 1810, ended the 28 years that she had spent in England and cut off all contact with her mother forever. Whether Lady Hamilton replied to this letter is not clear, as no record of a return correspondence has ever been found. Lady Emma Hamilton died in Calais, France, 1815, aged 54, with her second daughter, Horatia, at her side. Heavily in debt, she received a pauper's funeral and was interned in a cemetery in the same town. All traces of Emma Caru have stopped cold at this point, until the publication of Jackie Livis's article in 2014, Finding the Lost Daughter of Emma Hamilton. Through extensive research, Livesey uncovered an article published on the 19th of October, 1839, which appeared in a US publication called The Corsair, which looked at fashionable people and places in Tuscany. The journalist wrote, Among the residents of Florence, I must not fail to mention Emma Caru, the unfortunate daughter of the two celebrated Lady Hamilton, Her father, Sir William Hamilton, she was born previous to the marriage of her mother, left her a respectable provision. Unfortunately, it fell into the hands of her improvident parent, who was her guardian, and as well may be imagined, was speedily dissipated in her career of extravagance. Her unfortunate daughter long struggled to procure existence by teaching the English language, during which her privations must have been numerous. Latterly, her means have increased by a small pension from the Grand Duchess, wife of Leopold II, grandson of Maria Carolina, Queen of Naples, 
ostensibly in consideration of her mother's services to the royal family of Naples. There are several discrepancies with this, the most blatant being that Sir William Hamilton made no provisions whatsoever for Emma Hartley, or, as she was now known, Caru, in his will, and so no inheritance could ever have been spent after his death by his widow. The question of whether the Grand Duchess would have recognised and acknowledged Emma Caru to have been the legitimate daughter of Emma, Lady Hamilton, is also questionable. One can only come to the conclusion that, if we are to assume that it was indeed little Emma who turned up at the door of Merton, proudly telling the household that she was the daughter of Lady Hamilton, the very same woman could well have been prepared to be merciless regarding her mother's reputation and to tell a journalist tall stories in order to defame her. On the 26th of March, 1856, Emma Caru died in Florence, age 75. Historians have long suspected that she had died young due to her poor health and a weak chest, but in fact, she survived to a very respectable age for the period, being struck down by a fatal asthma attack. She was buried two days later in the English cemetery on the outskirts of Florence. Four porters carried her white, silk-lined coffin to plot number 595, dug by the gravedigger who was later responsible for burying Elizabeth Browning. Her funeral was conducted by a Reverend Gilbert. The total sum of little Emma's funeral and burial was 340 lira. In the cemetery's records, her name is not accompanied by any other family members, concluding that Emma Caru never married and remained alone all of her life. As the years went by, her final resting place was lost in time, with no headstone to mark the fact that she had ever even existed. However, in 2013, 131 years after her death, Professor Julia Bolton Holloway of the Dante School arranged for a plaque to be erected on the wall of the cemetery, close to the final resting place of Emma Caru. From her humble birth to a 17-year-old hostess who had been cast out of her lavish dwellings, to an excited little girl on a trip to the seaside with her newly discovered mother, to a supposed orphan and pupil in Manchester, to the woman who was fondly written about by Admiral Lord Nelson, to a daughter desperate to know her true parentage, to a governess and spinster residing in the same country that her mother achieved fame, Emma Caru lived her life with dignity and pride, at last, it appears, embracing the fact that her mother really was the celebrated and revered Lady Emma Hamilton. Perhaps her mother's early wishes, written to Greville in the letter from the seaside resort of Parkgate, had indeed come true to an extent. If she does turn out well, what a happiness it shall be. I love her, for she is sensible. In comparison to the infamous, too celebrated Lady Hamilton, who thrived on attention, human interaction, the love of those around her and sheer performance, Emma Caru lived what could be deemed a sensible life reaching an old age and living in a country that her mother had once dreamed of moving back to with Nelson. Her strength of character and her defying all odds, including poor health, poverty and a life of uncertainty, highlight Emma Caru as being all of the things that Emma Hamilton once longed to be. A resilient, independent, intelligent woman living self-sufficiently, having forged out a life for herself away from her mother and the suggestions of settling down with a good sort of man. For this, little Emma's star shines as brightly as that of her mother's. An autonomous woman of her time, Emma Caru lived and died with the decorum and strength that Lady Hamilton once hoped for her secret daughter. <laughs>